lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Hi, this is Tim with Morial TV and Morial Radio here live in Jerusalem, Israel with James Jacob Prash. Welcome to this week in prophecy coming to you this time from Jerusalem, Israel. Let's begin at the beginning, that is to say, where we are. I'm speaking to you from the Jaffa Gate, the place where King Herod's palace would have been located in the Second Temple period in the time of Jesus. At the... Uh, upper periphery of what was known as the upper city, at the end periphery of the upper city, sloping down towards the Tidalpian Valley in the time of Jesus. Now this location is very important because it is where the civil trial, that is the Herodian trial of Jesus would have been held, where jurisdiction was determined. It was in terms of modern jurisprudence really a <coughs> jurisdictional hearing to determine should he be tried imperially at the Port of Antonio by Pilate, or should he be tried by Herod uh, and have a Herodian trial following the religious trial in the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. So it was a matter of jurisdiction. Pilate wanted to unload it to Herod. Herod said, send them back to Pilate, and that would have taken place from where I'm speaking to you. In fact, the very place I'm speaking to you underneath there are archaeological pavements going back, not just to the time of Jesus, but even to the first temple period. Even to the first temple period, there are remnants of a <coughs> cistern, proving that water was available in the upper city, and that not all of the water supply of Jerusalem, or for the temple by any means, had to come from the Kidron Valley, as has been maintained by other people, such as our friend, Bob Cornuke, who's again a good guy, but he's wrong in what he's, he's saying. I'm also not very far from what would have been the pool of Hezekiah, a rather large pool located again in the upper city overlooking the Tyropean Valley. Natural aquifers, as well as alternative sources of water on the opposite side of the Tyropean Valley, coming in from the brook of Kidron as well. So Jerusalem was a well-watered city by the standards of the ancient world. 
despite its location, there was plenty of water. Uh, we're also near the area where a certain remnant of the moat predicted in Daniel with the reconstruction of the city in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah has, of course, been located. Many other things of archaeological significance from right where I'm speaking to you. That, however, is ancient history. Let's bring it forward. I maintain many times, cautiously, that there's a spiritual connection between the forces that tried to destroy Israel in the ancient world and those trying to destroy Israel in the modern world. When we look at prophecy, even this week in prophecy, we have to understand that. Um, again, on our teaching on Daniel chapter 10, we look at Iran and prophecy, and I explained, I have no doubt, that the Shia Islamic fundamentalism of the mullahs that was inaugurated in the time of Ayatollah Khomeini, after the fall of the peacock throne that dated back, at least ostensibly, to Cyrus the Great, is what Daniel saw, the principality, the prince, the demonic power over Iran, that is Persia, trying to destroy Israel, and it comes into play in the last days, a major force. But something else I have warned about is the role of Rome. Let us understand, once again, that coming originally from Pergamum, the title of Pontificus Maximus, the pontificate, the pontiff, the religious title of the Roman Emperor as head of the pantheon of Rome's religious system that was multi-religious. Uh, the pontiff, the emperor, a title bequeathed to the papacy and to the pope. So it has origins in the Babylonian influences that took place in Pergamum, where the term was first used and then applied to emperor worship and fully adopted by Imperial Rome and the Pantheon system, and then bequeathed in the time of Constantine the Great and the Emperor Justinian and afterwards to the Roman Papacy. Very near to where I am is the Latin Patriarchate, the seat of Roman Catholic representation in the Holy Land. Um, the Vatican has always tried to have a role brokering some kind of a peace between Jews, Christians, and Arabs here in the Holy Land. Now, this has a long history dating back to the time of the Crusades of the Roman Catholic involvement. Islam still resents what happened then, only they do not make a distinction between Protestants, Evangelicals, Catholics, Eastern Orthodox. They're all Christians, and they're all Crusaders in the Muslim mind. Nonetheless, this has not stopped the Vatican from trying to play a role of political influence in, quote-unquote, the Holy Land. We see this always coming into play with, with the Pope, and including the present Pope, the current one, who calls himself Francis. Well, let's go even further with this. In the time of Jesus, the Popes were all accepting of bisexuality and homosexuality. It is no coincidence that Pope Francis is the first Pope to say, if two men are in a same-sex relationship, who is he to judge? We have some breaking news right now. It comes from the papal aircraft. Pope Francis making a significant statement uh, showing conciliation to gay priests and, and gays and lesbians all around the world. Josh, we've just gotten the bulletin from the aircraft. Yeah, again, uh, this is uh, in Pope Francis. This is a man who spent his life in service, and it was thought that perhaps his election was in part because he represented uh, the churches reaching out to the disenfranchised. That has included women and gays, and in speaking for a little over an hour and answering questions with the press corps in Italian, and it says relaxed, often laughing and joking with him, he says not only will the role of women in the church be more prominent and important, this is also what he had to say, in specific about gay priests, if someone is gay, and I'm quoting, if someone is gay and he searches for the Lord and has goodwill, who am I to judge? End quote. This, of course, uh, does fly in the face, really, of his predecessor, Pope Benedict, who had said that men with deep-rooted homosexual tendencies should not be priests. Again, as you mentioned, George, just another sign of conciliation. And you know, this is a growing Francis. sentiment inside the church. Now, there's still opposition in the Catholic clergy to gay marriage, mm -hmm. but I spoke with Cardinal Dolan here in New York uh, several weeks ago, and I said, what would you say to a gay couple that comes to you and says, we love each other, and we, we want to live out that love? He said, I love you too, and God loves you. They're trying to reach out, trying to find ways to include everyone 
in that church now. But, but the Pope coming out and making those Massive. types of statement, statements like that, and he, we had a kind of an indication from him early on that he was going to be a different type yes. of leader. Yes, and I, I really feel like, again, the church, they realized that they had come to something of a crossroads and that they would have to make uh, gestures such mm -hmm. as these. And again, it's interesting, not only did he say it, but how it was said, again, in very relaxed back and right. forth. Exactly. And it comes off that amazing trip to Brazil this week where he was thronged, just, you know, oh, like especially so the young people. All over him. Absolutely. Big headline in the moment. He's doing what the pontiff did in the time of Jesus. He is giving a passive condoning, at least an implicit condoning, to what Romans and the book of Leviticus call sexual perversion. He wouldn't come out and just say it was wrong. Uh, just playing politics, saying he hasn't changed the official position of the Roman church, just the emphasis doesn't matter. If you were a homosexual or a Catholic homosexual, what would you say? Well, the Pope's not saying it's wrong. Why should you? Well, again, this is what the pontiffs always did. Many of the pon of the pontiffs themselves, that is the empress, in fact, most of them were homosexuals and bisexuals, which is, of course, widespread throughout the Roman Catholic clergy and its hierarchy. And its hierarchy. Well, again, you're seeing the same things happen now. The pontiff, the pontificus maximus, the great bridge builder between the faiths, trying to build a bridge between Judaism, that is Talmudic Judaism, a false Judaism, Christianity, a false Christianity, largely Roman Catholicism, mainstream Protestantism, Eastern Orthodoxy, and other denominations of the Eastern Church, and, uh, of course, Talmudic Judaism together with Islam. That is what is taking place. The pontiff wanting to be the bridge builder, the Latin patriarchate, a few hundred meters from where I'm speaking to you. Same powers, all coming in, wanting to do the same thing. Rome wanting to control. Rome wanting the influence. What it has always been, so it is. When you come here, and I've lived in this city, in fact, I've lived a few hundred meters from where I'm speaking to you. I've lived immediately adjacent to late Latin patriarchate when I was in my in my uh, mid-twenties. Uh, you really feel it. You can sense it. If you have a sense of history and a knowledge of church history and a knowledge of scripture, you sense in the atmosphere what's really happening. Most of the tourists and pilgrims who come here, however, do not. They just want to go to a Latin church and sing Ave Maria or to a Protestant church and hear a lecture. But not understanding the real prophetic theology of what's transpiring in this amazing city where prophecy will climax. Having said that, let's move on to this very week, this very week in prophecy. In the Gaza Strip, bullets were fired, most likely by Hamas or those protected by Hamas at Israeli soldiers, and the Israeli soldiers returned fire. The ongoing saga, the so-called suffering of the people of Gaza, in actual fact, the people of Gaza saw an increase in their standard of living of 370% under the Israelis after the 1967 conquest of Gaza. In self-defense by the Israelis, the standard of living went up 370%. It was only after the Israelis left that the Palestinian Authority embezzled the international aid given to construct an infrastructure in Gaza helping to <clears throat> sway popular opinion in Gaza in favor of Hamas as an alternative, who in turn looted Gaza for its Islamic jihadist war machine against Israel. It again debunks the myth of land for peace. Every time Israel has given land for peace, there was no peace. Just gave up the land to the Islamists. It's a way to continue the jihad. This was true in southern Lebanon, and it's certainly true in Gaza. And there's no doubt it would be true of East Jerusalem, of the West Bank, or of the Golan Heights. It is simply that simple. Every time Israel's given up land for peace, they gave up the land, but they got no peace. They have made peace with proper nations, such as Egypt or Jordan, at least until now, but there has never been a peace with terrorist Islamic organizations with any kind of an Islamic ideology. Even the ones that claim to be moderate, such as the Palestinian Authority, certainly nothing associated with the Muslim Brotherhood, such as Hamas, 
or, of course, Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. Shooting again this week, the Israelis returned fire. The talk in Israel now politically is about Donald Trump's proposed visit and his desire to revive the peace process with Mr. Abbas. The two-state solution is stupid. Okay, I knew it was stupid when I was nine, and they were doing the Oslo Accords. It turns out that giving terrorists a state is not a good idea. The Palestinian Authority was a terrorist group. It is a terrorist group. Hamas is a terrorist group. Islamic Jihad is a terrorist group. Giving terrorists a state is a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. And when you say we're making a peace deal and the peace deal is going to be that at the end you get a state, you've already given up what you're negotiating. Right? There's no more negotiation. So why exactly would the Palestinians give up anything at that point? Why would they stop the terrorism? They know what the end point of this negotiation is, and they know that all the pressure is on Israel to concede things. Beyond that, the, the stupidity of Oslo was saying that, that the Palestinians have a right to an independent state. There is no such historic right for the Palestinians to have an independent state. That state was called Jordan historically. Right? When, the, when they partitioned British Mandate Palestine, there were, there were two states, right? There were, originally, there were, there were really only two states, and it was Jordan and Israel, and that was it. And then they sliced off another like quasi-little state, and that was the, the so-called West Bank and Gaza Strip, and the Arabs rejected that deal. So there's no history to having a, another, in a second Palestinian state in the region. Jordan is 70% Palestinian. The idea that it was, it was a foregone conclusion, the only way there was ever going to be peace was to put a terrorist group in charge of the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Absolute stupidity. When the Jews pulled out of the Gaza Strip, it immediately was turned into Hamasistan, which is an actual terror state. And, you know, the fact that, that everybody keeps glomming onto this two-state deal, this two-state solution, is really dumb. And it was really dumb for the Israelis to do it because it was basically suggesting that the Jews were interlopers in the region. That the Jews had to make some sort of deal to give away the heart of what it means to be Jewish, really. I mean, Judea and Samaria are the heart of biblical Israel. Giving away the heart of biblical Israel to the, the Palestinian Arabs suggests that they have a primacy of historical claim that simply does not exist. Oslo was foolish for that reason, historically, morally, politically, an abomination. And finally, recognizing that after 25 years of failure seems like a pretty good approach. It seems like after, after doing this for two decades of silliness, maybe we should try something else. Now, there are a bunch of different things that could be done here. One could be just a continuation of status quo, which is you don't get to ship weapons in. You guys get to handle your own crap internally. And as long as there's no terrorism, we can have free flow of people in and out of, of Palestinian areas without granting independent statehood. That's not an apartheid state. Okay? The United States basically has that sort of relationship with Puerto Rico. Right? Puerto Rico isn't a sovereign country. Puerto Rico is still administered. It's a, it's a territory of the United States, technically. They don't get to vote in the presidential elections. They're not American citizens. But the United States actually helps out in the administration of Puerto Rico. And so suggesting that this is some sort of apartheid state, if they were to come to this sort of arrangement, is silly. There's also the Carolyn Glick solution, which would be a one-state solution, which is basically Israel annexes everything. And then Israel actually gives citizenship to the Palestinians because, guess what? There are six million Jews in the area. There are only like a million and a half Palestinians. And that's not the world's biggest deal. So there are plenty of solutions other than we have to give an independent state to a bunch of genocidal people who wish to wipe Jews off the map. It's always funny. They always talk about the Jews participating in some sort of ethnic cleansing effort uh, by, by moving Palestinians. They never talk about the Palestinians forcibly moving Jews out of pa How many Jews live in, quote unquote, Palestine? The answer is zero. Zero Jews live there. How many Israeli Arabs live in Israel? Over a million. So the idea that, that the ethnic cleansing is coming from the Jewish side is really quite spectacularly stupid. Getting rid of the, the idea that the Palestinians have to have their own state as a precondition for any negotiation is, uh, is a good first step because if you're actually going to have a negotiation, everything should be on the table. Nothing should be off the table. The reason Netanyahu wants to bring in regional partners on the peace deal is because he knows that Jordan doesn't want the Palestinians. He knows Egypt doesn't want the Palestinians. He knows the Saudis don't want the Palestinians. He knows all of them oppose a Palestinian state. Here's the reality. Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, none of them want a Palestinian state. They all pretend they do for public consumption. None of them actually do. The reason they don't actually want that is because if there were a Palestinian state on the border of Jordan, it would immediately become a terror threat to Jordan itself. And the Egyptians don't want a Palestinian terror state on their border. They've been having all sorts of border trouble. Uh, uh, the, the leader, al-Sisi, has been having all sorts of border trouble with, with Gaza stand, with, with Hamas stand in Gaza, because Egypt is in control of the Sinai Desert, which runs all the way up to the Gaza Strip. So none of these countries actually want there to be a Palestinian state. Netanyahu knows that. That's why Netanyahu is saying we should have a regional approach here. Listen, Netanyahu, okay, the, the, the Israeli government has an has a on-the-table constant offer to the Jordanians that if the Jordanians want to take over all of the Palestinian territories, they can. You know what the Jordanians say? They say no. No one wants to be in charge of this. You know why? Because it's filled with a terror government.
This is, again, something we need to be leery of, and we need to pray for Mr. Trump and his Secretary of State and his defense. Abbas is not a man to be trusted. He continues to celebrate Islamic terror. He continues to pay money to the families of terrorists who have murdered Israelis. He continues to fund all kinds of things, including the oppression of Arab Christians. He is not a good man. He simply is a political animal, purely a political animal, and he is not much better or much different than Hamas, except in his desire to keep power for himself as the heir of Yasser Arafat. Well, let's go further even with this. Mr. Trump needs to be very, very careful. To date, the American embassy has not been relocated to Jerusalem. It could be relocated at least as a door seal to the American consulate, not in East Jerusalem, but in West Jerusalem. It wouldn't take much. It wouldn't even take a construction project. I pray that he keeps his promise. And I believe God will bless America if he does, but I do not believe God will bless America if he presses Israel to make concessions to the Palestinian Authority, who are again not really any better than Hamas. They simply play the public relations card to get money from Europe and America. I think the United States needs to stop funding to the Palestinian Authority until they stop teaching children in school to celebrate suicide uh, and other such things. Nonetheless, let's move on. What the Palestinian Authority says to the West in English or French or German is very different than what it says in Arabic to its own people. They say two different things at the same time. We have to understand that they are using the Islamic doctrine of tahwid, permissible lying. The Quran allows permissible lying to the infidel, that is to the non-Muslim, because they don't see it as a lie. They simply see it as military disinformation in the jihad. So they're allowed to lie. You never know when a Muslim is telling you the truth because like a Jehovah's Witness, his religion or her religion allows permissible lying. The big news strategically this week, however, in Israel was again pushing towards the prophetic fulfillment ultimately of Isaiah 17. We have had reports, reliable reports, that the sounds of the explosion were so loud they radiated throughout much of Damascus. The Israeli Air Force carried out as many as five airstrikes on targets associated with Iran near and around, or in fact almost adjacent to, at least one strike was adjacent to, Damascus International Airport, which is used both, both for civilian air cargo and military purposes. The Israelis hit pretty strongly and have not denied that they did it, but something else happened that the media has overlooked. In the past, there's always been intercontinental ballistic missiles with anti-ballistic missile systems designed to take them down. This was first developed in prototype in the 1960s, but then with the Star Wars project of the Reagan administration, using advanced laser and satellite technology, it was revived again. But it was always for missiles of an intercontinental range. Something has happened here in Israel as part of its Iron Dome project to protect from short-term missile and rocket attacks, including things as small as Katushas, which are deadly but not big. Uh, it is the Arrow missile system jointly developed by Israel and the United States. It is said to be the most advanced anti-missile system or, or anti-missile defense system for short and medium range missiles ever developed. If there's anything more advanced, it's secret. But it was first activated here in Israel and it's had its first demonstration in actual combat, in actual warfare. The Arrow missiles were launched to take down missiles fired from inside of Syria. Some of the targets hit by the Israeli Air Force were certainly Iranian, and there were likely Iranian casualties <clears throat> among those killed by the Israeli Air Force. Missiles were fired at Israel, again, not 
long range, but short to medium range, and they were successfully taken down by the Arab by the Arrow system. At least two fell in Israel into the Jordan Valley, doing no harm to anyone. Another one was believed to have fallen inside northern Jordan, but they were fired from Syria at Israeli positions, and the Israelis successfully took them down. Hence, the Iron Dome protective system so far seems to be working. For the first time ever, the Arrow missile system was used in actual warfare, and it was used successfully. Again, the American technological assistance in developing this will be beneficial both to the United States and to Israel. Let's move on. Israel has moved against Syria. Now, notice when the United States moved against the side, it was headline news. When the Israelis moved against his regime and his, his Iranian partners, it was played down. It is almost certain that the weapons were of Soviet, I'm sorry, of Russian manufacture, of Russian manufacture, arrived from Iran and were being transferred to Hezbollah forces. Hezbollah forces that operate both in support of the Assad regime in Syria and in southern Lebanon against Galilee. Hence the Israeli motivation for the airstrikes. But let's look even further. Things are certainly heating up. Something else has taken place, again, that the international media has not given a lot of attention to inside of Syria. American-backed Syrian forces were bombed by the Turks. There are Turkish freedom fighters, as they would call themselves, the PKK, who are fighting for the rights of the oppressed Kurdish people inside Turkey. They carry out attacks that are described as terror, and of course the Turks are wanting to keep control of that region of Kurdistan where the Kurds live inside of Turkey. The Turks do not want a Kurdish state in northern Iraq on their border, given the fact that there are 20 million Kurds, many of them living inside of Turkey, demanding their own country. Some of Turkey, some of what we call Turkey today, was not historical Turkey. There are coastal areas that the Turks around the city of Izmir, near the biblical city of Smyrna, were taken from the Greeks. The European side of the Bosporus, of Istanbul, the top copy area of Istanbul, which is the main commercial and historical area of Istanbul, was Constantine City, Constantinople, was again taken from the Greeks. It was Harem on the Asian side of the Bosporus that was the non-European area of, of what is today called Istanbul. So you have areas that the Turks took from the Greeks, and there are Greeks and Greek Cypriots who want those areas back. It's not talked about, but there is a national ambition or sentiment or sense they took this from us. Similarly, you have the oppression and the genocide of the Armenians. About 300 meters from where I'm speaking to you is the Armenian quarter in Jerusalem. One of the places Armenian refugees arrived following the Turkish Holocaust. The Turks murdered over two million Armenians. Now this took place after the early Pentecostal revivals. Similar to the revivals that took place in early Pentecostalism that people identify with Azusa Street, or the Sunshine Revivals in Australia, or those in the north of England that people connect with Smith, Smith Wigglesworth, there was an early Pentecostalism independent of those things that took place in Armenia. But those people, again, faced genocidal onslaught at the hands of the Turkish Muslims. With the emergence of the Erdogan regime, Islamic nationalism has again risen in Turkey. Erdogan won the election, but most European governments, and certainly the European press, believe the election was rigged. I consider it to be less than wise that Mr. Trump called Mr. Erdogan and congratulated him on that election victory. Right after Mr. Trump did it, 
Mr. Erdogan took it as a green light to bomb Turkish targets supported by uh, Kurdish targets by the Americans inside of Syria. Within a week after Mr. Trump called to congratulate him, he was bombing American-backed Kurdish forces who were fighting ISIS. America was given due warning to get its own troops out of the target zone, the same as the Americans warned the Russians to get their troops out of the target zone. Uh, this is what's really going on, but it's not being widely reported by the Western press or the mainstream media. Now understand, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it's something that certainly, certainly would be consistent with the view, it would be consistent with the view of Agog and Magog, <clears throat> Ezekiel 38 and 39 scenario, apart from the one again at the end of the book of Revelation, another one that would prefigure it, that would be recapitulated at the end of the millennium in Revelation. Is the stage being set for it? Well, again, we've mentioned last week's prophecy broadcast that there has been something of a rapprochement between Russia and Turkey. But this week's developments, the bombing of non-PKK forces, these were not PKK forces, they were another Turkish force back armed and trained by the Americans to fight ISIS that the Turks bombed following Mr. Trump giving his congratulations to Mr. Erdogan, who is again an Islamic Turkish nationalist, moving Turkey into a Sharia direction. This is what is actually taking place this week in prophecy. Well, let's move further with this. Here in Jerusalem this week, the mayor of Jerusalem welcomed and embraced a number of Christian leaders, Christian with a small c, expressing compassion for the plight of Christians in so many Middle Eastern countries, even in Egypt, where the Assisi regime is trying to protect them to a degree from the Muslim Brotherhood. Christian observances in <clears throat> Easter were tuned down all over the Middle East as the Christian population dissipates. There are only about a thousand Christians left in Gaza, only a thousand having been forced out by Islamic extremists, that is by Hamas. But again, the Western media says nothing. It makes the Gazans out to be the victim, even though the Israelis gave land for peace, and the Gazans only used the land they received to continue their jihad against Israel, forcing Israel to return fire and self-defense. As we spoke about last week, and as we've mentioned multiple times, the basic Hamas tactic is to target Israeli civilians and then use their own civilians as human shields so when the Israelis return fire, the BBC, the CNN, MSNBC, and so forth will blame Israel for defending its own civilians, not blaming Hamas for attacking Israeli civilians and using its own women and children as human shields. Neither did they talk about how the Israelis allow and give free medical and surgical care to the people of Gaza. But the plight of the people in Gaza has again become worse this week, not at the hands of the Israelis, but at the hands of the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. Mr. Abbas and his regime have announced that they will no longer pay for the electricity of Gaza. There are already blackouts in Gaza. It only has one Hamas-controlled power generating station. The electricity comes from Israel. Israel actually supplies that electricity. Well, the Palestinian Authority is going to cut it off. Uh, this will either be ignored by the press, or it will be ignored by the press initially, and then the mainstream media will find a way to blame Israel for it. Again, what these people do to each other is unspeakable, but nobody says a word. We're down to a thousand Christians in Gaza. The mainstream media does not say a word. What has become of the Christians in Syria and Iraq is unspeakable. Nobody says a word. Christian refugees in Jordan, King Abdullah has allowed them in, God bless him, but their plight, unspeakable. Nobody says a word. 
hardly anyone, except, of course, the Israelis. The Israelis have shown solidarity with these Christians. Much the same as when Iran <coughs> animated Hezbollah, drove the Christian population, the phalanges, out of southern Lebanon, the Israelis took the Christian refugees and gave them Israeli citizenship. The world ignored that. The world ignored that. Again, making Islam the victim when Israel Israelis are forced to fight back in self-defense, ignoring what happens to the Christian population. Well, the plight of the Christian population is unspeakable. Again, this past week in prophecy, Iran has again announced further legal crackdowns on any kind of political activity in Iran involving Christians. Going even further towards the east, Kazakhstan has begun to do the same thing. And Kazakhstan would have been one of those nations in the constellation of forces coming against Israel in Ezekiel 38 and 39. All of these nations are draining the blood of what is left of the Christian population of the Middle East. There is only one place where Christians are absolutely secure. Only one place where they're given equal rights. Only one place where Arab Christians have freedom and safety, and that is Israel. Yet, that is the place the world wants to boycott. Nobody wants to boycott Saudi oil. Everybody wants to boycott Israel due to the left-wing agenda. This has become absolutely ridiculous. They are turning their plight on the backs of Christians, of women, and not that I'm defending homosexuality, but even, of course, of homosexuals and lesbians. Story continues. This increasingly anti-Christian sentiment has radiated throughout the Islamic world increasingly over the last year to a year and a half, even though it's always been there. Because of the growth of the church in Indonesia, the most populous Islamic country in the world, there has been an increase in the number of Christians because of people leaving Islam and animism. But certainly Islam, millions of Muslims have become Christian. It is only when in a probably rigged direction, a rigged election, candidate lost the election that criminal charges were dropped against him in Indonesia. Again, they are using political means. In Pakistan this week, the Pakistani government has refused, refused to enact legislation that would illegalize the abduction of Christian girls into forced marriages. They refused to make it illegal to abduct Christian girls into forced marriages with forced conversions to Islam. Nobody says a word. CNN will not report it. MSNBC will not report it. The BBC, as a biased blasphemy and cowardice, will not report it. Channel 4 News in the UK will not report it. None of them will report it. Can you imagine? It's legal to abduct an underage girl, force her to marry a relative, a blood relative, and force her to change her religion. And it's not illegal. This is what you're dealing with. This is the true barbarism of village Islam and Islamic fundamentalism. And again, moderate Muslims do not speak up and say a word. The so-called moderate Muslims. Well, let's move on this week in prophecy. Here in Israel, something unfortunate has happened. The scandal-ridden Hillsong from Australia, first exposed in national news documentaries for financial corruption in Australia, followed by the series of sex scandals with the homosexual pedophilia of its patriarch Frank Houston, of its number two in command, Pat Masidi with women, <clears throat> the shameful series, Christian Women Love Sex by Bobby Houston, and then ultimately the refusal of Carl Lynn, their pastor of Hillsong, New York, to speak out about homosexuality when questioned on <clears throat> television if it was wrong or not, uh, followed by the climactic women's conference where 
Hillsong had Jesus come out in female drag as the Statue of Liberty with the crown of Lady Liberty instead of the crown of thorns holding a torch, singing New York, New York to him, calling this worship. Followed by the extravaganza that was staged and rehearsed. That is, it was choreographed with pyrotechnics of the naked cowboy standing there with his boots, his cowboy hat, and his guitar. Uh, this is Hillsong. Well, Hillsong has arrived in Israel. Most Israeli believers in the local body of Christ are oblivious, even in the age of the internet, to what happens in the diaspora. They don't know that these things are wrong. More than that, there are import agents who bring in every kind of heresy that gains popular momentum in the diaspora, into Israel. These are largely funded from the United States. Hillsong has now arrived and had, has had its first concert in Quesadilla and is opening a congregation to appeal to Israeli young people now that the numbers of young Israelis coming to faith is increasing in the area of Tel Aviv. This is most unfortunate. Hillsong, with its history of financial and sex scandals, is here. Hillsong also says, of course, Brian Houston, the God of Islam, is the same as the God of Christians and Jews. This is what is happening. And it has arrived. And there are enough naive Israelis to go along with it, not realizing how wrong it is. Please pray against Hillsong, and please pray against the agents of Satan in Israel who import these kinds of things and who want to hear. This is not a new problem, but it's gotten worse. The anti-mission law in Israel, the most recent one um, of more than a decade ago now, was triggered in the Knesset after Morris Cirillo, the American money preacher, appeared on TV in England saying, send 10 pounds and see two Jews saved. And as an added bonus, two members of your family will be born again. This was on Dispatches, a major national TV weekly program of, of, of news broadcast in, in Britain, roughly the equivalent of what 60 Minutes is in the USA. Uh, Mr. Cirillo uh, also was exposed by Sir Montague Levine, the crown coroner of the UK and the, the, the royal pathologist, the number one post-mortem pathologist at the time in Great Britain, when he did an autopsy on a young woman who drowned in her back when she ceased taking, ceased taking anti-epilepsy medication when Morris Cirillo pronounced her falsely to be healed. Well, Cirillo came to Israel and distributed a book with the assistance of two Americans, Ari and Shira Sakharov, uh, called Hashalom, that was, in its content, not very good and not circulated with the approval of the Israeli body of Christ. A number of Israeli congregations protested and wrote a series of articles in a journal called Mishkan and denounced it. It was denounced by a number of Israeli figures, such as Lisa Loden, Joseph Shulam, and others, but the law was passed as a result. <clears throat> this was facilitated by Ari and Shira Sakharov. Ari and Shira Sakharov also played a role in bringing the Toronto experience into Israel, a laughing and drunking revival that took place in conjunction with a pair of <clears throat> false teachers called the Berger Brothers here in Jerusalem, where they were laughing on the floor in hysterics during the time of national mourning for the assassination of Itzhak Rabin. Again, there's been a long history of this stuff being imported into Israel by fruitcakes from the United States. When 6,000 Katusha missiles fell on Galilee, supplied by Syria to Hezbollah, paid for by Iran, manufactured in Russia, but it was a Syrian enterprise, Galilee was devastated. Haifa itself was rained on as well as the usual targets, such as Metula and other such cities at the border like Kiryat Shmona and uh, Nahariya, with the Moriel bases. Thousands of Katushas fell. A few weeks earlier, Rick Warren came to Syria and sang the praises of Assad, that same Assad now responsible for the genocidal extermination of so much of the Christian population in Syria. And 
for the shower of Katushas that fell a few weeks later. But again, it was these same people, Ari and Shira Sakharam, that published his book, The Purpose Driven Life, in Hebrew. These people have done incredible damage to the cause of Christ, to Yeshua in Israel, and we need to pray against them, that God puts an end to their reign of terror in this country. They've done nothing but damage. Shira Sakharam is associated by family relations with Christ for the nations in Dallas. She's a Gentile woman who converted to Judaism. Ari Sakharam has an Afro-American wife and children, supposedly from a previous marriage. It's not clear if he is Jewish. She certainly is not. Yet they somehow put on a conversion front and uh, represented themselves that way. They have been the import agents for one seduction and heresy after another, and we urge people to pray against them and what they are doing and the damage they have done. Many Israelis naively go along with them or say nothing, not understanding what really happens in the diaspora <clears throat> and the corruption of things, like Morris Cirillo, exposed in the media. Send 10 pounds and see two Jews saved. This didn't matter to the Sakharovs. 6,000 Katushas falling on Galilee and the Syrian Christian population being wiped out. But Assad is called the hero who protects Christians by Rick Warren, and they put his book into Hebrew. Again, there is a cancer in the body of Yeshua in Israel, a carcinogen. There is also a hyper-messianic element putting people under the law. Uh, these are the messianic wing of the new apostolic reformation. Associated with the figures in America, again, like Dan Juster, who come over here with Israeli counterparts like Eitan Shishkov and, unfortunately, someone called Mr. Intrader. These people themselves are largely ignorant of, tal of the Talmudic Judaism they seem to imitate. But again, there's simply new apostolic reformation figures coming to Israel. Another problem in Israel has been neo-Ebionism. Jews who believe Jesus is the Messiah but deny his deity. And others who are prepared to defend the denial of his deity, even when they don't deny it themselves. One Israeli pastor places it as as much as 30% prepared to defend Ebionism. Although the Ebionites are a small percentage, they have a national influence. Again, now that the body of Christ is growing in Israel, it is under satanic attack and under satanic infiltration. Satan is trying to destroy it from within. He has his agents in place to do so. And now Hillsong this week has arrived in Israel, most unfortunately, this week in prophecy. The seduction of the body of Christ in Israel continues. There are, however, a number of good and godly pastors who hold fast to the word of God, who do not support these things. But the poison is here, and as in the diaspora, it aims for the youth. Well, let's continue. Let's see what else is transpiring this week. Let's move from the Middle East to Europe. Again, the election in France is something we said last week that needs to be continually monitored carefully. We've made reference to it adequately so far, and we will, Lord willing, address it again, but we just, again, strongly suggest that people watch the results of those elections. It seems to be a lose-lose situation, but God is ultimately in control. The reason I point it out is there has been a very, very conspicuous increase in the number of French-speaking Jews in Israel. The French Jewish population had been about 700,000. Israel has seen major phases of immigrants coming from different countries. At one time, there was a burst of Romanians, certainly a burst of Jews from the former Soviet, Russians and Ukrainian Jews. Certainly the Falashas, the Jews from Ethiopia, they all have had their era, their turn, where you see a dramatic increase of Jews migrating en masse. It began 
certainly after the Holocaust of the, uh, of the Second World War, when refugees from the Holocaust and the concentration camps um, evading the British blockades arrived in Israel after the Second World War, just before the independence, that was the beginning. The second major one was the arrival of the Yemenites, the Jews from the Southern Arabian Peninsula. But it's continued. The Romanians, the Russians, the Ethiopians, etc. Certainly there was a major influx of Jews from Iran when Ayatollah Khomeini came to power and the Shah of Iran fell. I was here at that time and witnessed it. You saw an increase of Jews speaking Persians and of Israelis speaking Persian. Farsi. Well now, when you walk down the streets of Jerusalem, this Tel Aviv and its suburbs, uh, places like Nahariya, you're hearing more and more and more French. In supermarkets, call it stores, grocery shops, you're hearing more and more people speaking French. Again, they will come from all of the nations. And anti-Semitism is a definite, definite mechanism for causing the Jews to return to this land. The problem, of course, is prophetically they're not secure here either. They will ultimately make a covenant with death and trust the Antichrist to bring a peace and he will betray them. Their only security is in turning to Yeshua, the Messiah. All of these weeks in prophecy are pointing to the 70th week of Daniel when these events will climax. The Antichrist will indeed come. He will bring a false peace. He will betray Israel. But then the real Messiah will come. And he will reign on the throne of David from this very city. Praise Yeshua. His trial was where I am seated. But he will reign 15 minutes walk from where I am seated. From the Temple Mount. One day. Let's continue looking at what else happened in Europe this week. We always have to understand the real target of Satan. We know that the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower Society, is a demonic cult. It's that and nothing but that. Going back to the time of Rutherford and Charles Tassie Russell, it's a demonic cult and its beliefs are often really implausible joke when you look at what these people are taught and what they believe. And most of them are ignorant of the actual origins of what Charles Tazzy Russell said and did. It's a bad organization. It's a cult that destroys families and marriages and misleads people and that appeals to uneducated people, generally speaking. In Russia, it was made illegal by the Russian Supreme Court. And it was ordered by the court that all properties belonging to the Watchtower Society would be seized. They were not allowed to meet and that Jehovah's Witnesses could face arrest under prevention of terror laws. Well, that's quite a thing. That is quite a thing indeed. Well, who cares about the Watchtower Society? We're better off without it. But that's not Satan's real target. Satan's real target is the body of Christ. As Russia continues to face economic disintegration, the Warsaw Pact is gone, the Soviet Union is gone, the CIS, the Confederation of Independent States is gone, what we call in Hebrew, the whole Brit Marzot is gone. Now Russia is on the very precipice of internal fragmentation due to its demographic decline, aging population, reducing longevity, and the growth of Islam and the Islamic population in Russia being the only really major growing sector. Uh, Russia is facing major problems. Half of its government revenue comes from oil. The price of oil is again below $50 a barrel. It's not going to go back up above 100 as it was. They've tried everything to flex their muscle uh, by creating instability in the Middle East in the hope that would artificially drive up gas and oil prices, but due to fracking, etc., it has not worked. Well, Mr. Putin has to play the nationalist card to try to keep power. And he sees the Russian Orthodox Church active here at the Russian compound, not far from where I am, in Jerusalem. During the Cold War, it had been the base of KGB operations inside Jerusalem and inside Israel. 
on religious grounds they were given religious visas, but they were essentially KGB agents. The whole thing was a KGB front. Be that as it may, he has to play the nationalist card of which the Russian Orthodox Church is a cardinal ingredient. That spells anti-evangelicism. These laws passed in Russia are simply a phase, an intermediate stage to the real aims of Satan. There is new legislation coming into Russia that will be presented for ratification that will make evangelicism almost illegal. As it is, if you go into Russia and speak in a church, you need a visa. You will need prior consent under this new law, prior consent for any Russian believer to share their faith, prior consent from the government, even to invite someone to a church service. Again, what's happened to the Jehovah's Witnesses is just Satan's vehicle for what his real target is to stop the spread of the gospel inside of Russia. This pretty much is in line with David Wilkinson's prophecy that he gave a number of years ago in the 1970s, that the Iron Curtain would go up, the gospel would flood in, but then it would come down, and the religious freedom would disappear. The Jews would come out, as others have prophesied, and that has largely, though not totally, happened as yet. We have to understand Satan's real agenda. What happened with the Jehovah's Witnesses this week in prophecy is just a stepping stone for the new religious set law, basically outlawing all evangelism unless you have the approval of the Russian government to do so. On any level, even a church invitation. Well, let's move forward once again. Satan's real agenda, let's shift to the United States. The anti-constitutional antics of the Supreme Court have again been manifested. The Supreme Court having no constitutional mandate to do so has in the past defined life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to disinclude the life of an embryo. That was the job of Congress to decide if an embryo was human or not, but the Supreme Court ruled, thinking it's the supreme being. Now the Texas law that has put medical restrictions on abortion clinics has been outlawed by the Supreme Court, making the decision it's not necessary to protect the life or the health of the mother. In other words, to protect abortion rights, something where the Constitution is silent and is the domain of the states or of the Congress to legislate, the out-of-control Supreme Court has done it again. The usual witch, the daughter of Satan, I'm ashamed to say a Jew, Ginsburg, how will that woman not go to hell soon, given her age? I do not know. May the Lord have mercy on her, despite her many atrocities. Of course, Kennedy, an utterly sickening man, Again, I pray for the day when these judges will stand before the real judge. I pray for the day when these judges will stand before the real judge, unless they repent and put their faith in Jesus. That would be my preference, but it's not likely to happen. And something. What is Satan's real agenda in these things? Jesus said to be brought before magistrates and kings. Notice he said, the laws will be made by courts. Corrupt politicians, as I said in the past, are more than happy to forego their responsibility to legislate on controversial issues and let the courts decide so they won't lose votes. If I'm pro-abortion, I'll lose votes. If I'm anti-abortion, I'll lose votes. Let the courts decide. And politicians, largely being spineless, will do that. Not all of them, but most of them of both parties. And that's exactly what is transpiring. Satan's real agenda. At the University of Arkansas, of all places, three professors, 
demanding that a Jewish American liberal feminist speaker be banned. All the media was focused this week on Ann Coulter's escapade in Berkeley, California, at the University of Berkeley, public institution, where the free speech movement was born in 1966. Now it's the anti-free speech movement. They let radical speakers of different persuasions in, but they will not allow alternative points of view. That's what it comes to. The police will not enforce the law under political pressure not to do so. When you have a governor like the governor of California, what do you expect? This was the focus of the media. Notice the same mainstream media, much of it hailing it as a victory. Even though it was a blow against free speech, said nothing about what happened at another university in Arkansas. A liberal feminist speaker was opposed by a portion of the student body and three liberal professors. Why would they be against a liberal feminist speaker from their own political camp, ostensibly? Because she was speaking to the issue of women's rights, of genital mutilation, forced marriages, etc., taking place in Islamic countries, the rights of women in Islamic countries. She was banned like Ann Coulter was, stricken from the agenda for speaking up for women's rights, because it was in an Islamic country. That university, like so many universities, was funded in some of its programs by Saudi Arabia. The Saudi Arabians won't pay for their own defense. They expect the Americans to do that. They won't take in Arab Muslim refugees from Syria. They expect Europe and America to do that. But they'll fund the propagation of Sharia and fundamentalist Islam in the United States and other Western countries and in the university system. And hypocritical professors claiming to be liberal will say nothing about the violation of human rights among homosexuals, Christians, or women. It shows the utter stinking hypocrisy of the feminist left in America. These pink-hatted hypocrites. Having, among others, Linda Sassor as one of their leaders, a woman who defends Islamic terror in Israel, essentially. She says you cannot be a supporter of Israel and a feminist. She goes around wearing a halaj. They'll have her, but in their march against Mr. Trump, they would not allow a pro-life woman who opposed Mr. Trump ideologically to participate as a featured speaker in their protest, but they'll have a radical Islamist who's pro-Sharia. She says Saudi Arabia is good. It gives 10 weeks paid leave for an oil-rich country that lives off the back of imported foreign labor who's underpaid and mistreated and American protection can easily do that. But you won't find it throughout the rest of the Islamic world where the oil money is not there. And you won't find it in Saudi Arabia for the poor women. That is the foreign labor women, the Filipinos, or the women from Pakistan, or India, or from East Africa who work in Saudi Arabia. I've been there. Complete hypocrite. Don't bring a Bible to Saudi Arabia. You cannot do anything in Saudi Arabia. And the political whores of America, particularly the Bush dynasty, complete political prostitutes, unprincipled people who the Saudi Arabians carried in their back pocket, said not a word either to James Baker, Mr. Cheney, and so forth. They just went along with the Saudi agenda, as Mr. Obama pandered to the Iranians. Utter hypocrisy by the American feminist left. Linda Sousser, the oppression of women's rights. They're so much for gay and lesbian rights, except in the Islamic world. It's not really about 
homosexuality and lesbianism. It's not really about feminism or women's rights. When it comes to the propagation of Sharia and bringing Sharia into the American judicial system and into the cultural influence of the West, they shut up. They even crack down on their own kind. They give platform to pro-Sharia speakers at a feminist rally protest against Mr. Trump remaining deaf to what really happens in these countries that support her, that sponsor her. And stupid left-wing American Jewish women go along with it. They have no idea what would happen to them if the people she represents, God forbid, ever had their way. It was the same hypocrisy during the presidential election with Hillary Clinton getting $25 million from Saudi Arabian interests for her so-called charity. Not a word was said. The mainstream media said nothing. They will even crack down on their own liberal feminists if it offends Saudi Arabia. They're no different than Bush and no better. Hypocrisy upon hypocrisy. What happened with Ann Coulter was a disgrace. It never should have happened. She should have been allowed to speak. But the media was all over it. We heard almost nothing about what happened in the University of Arkansas where liberal professors, liberal, pro-feminist, pro-homosexual, lesbian, gay, whatever, professors would not allow a feminist activist to speak about women's rights in Islamic countries. The hypocrisy and the depths of the hypocrisy is unbelievable. Well, let's move further this week in history. I was in China recently, a few weeks ago, and in China it is commonplace for people, particularly young people, not to carry pocket change, but to use cell phones for minor transactions. Electronic cash using iPhones. It has not really been launched in the United States even as a prototype or experiment yet. The experiment took place in China, where it's already quite active. It'll be no big deal to implement it in the United States. And this week, Apple announced it is going to make a move towards cell phone money, cell phone transactions in the American market. Again, all of these things are moving towards Revelation chapter 13. Every week, we see something in the economic and financial domain pushing trends in commerce and finance in that general direction. Quite a thing. But again, it's not getting the kind of attention it actually warrants, not even in much of the Christian media. And so we go. You know, this Linda Sarsa, this activist, was brought into a publicly funded CCNY, New York University, City University of New York, uh, student function, it, it may have been a commencement, as a speaker, a pro-Sharia activist representing countries where women are oppressed and can't even drive a car, and that's accepted. But Ann Coulter, an outspoken woman who exercises women's rights, are banned from campuses. They've lost their mind. They have no integrity. They have no courage. But they have no brains. It gets worse and worse and worse. And so we go. This week in prophecy. Jesus is indeed coming soon. Where I'm seated is where he stood before Herod. When he comes back, we shall all stand before him as judge. May we be covered 
with his blood and righteousness on that day. For he is indeed coming soon. This is Jacob Parrish for This Week in Prophecy, speaking to you from Jerusalem. God bless and thank you for listening. Dear friends, greetings of Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But... In this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. First being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen. Will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.